We are very excited tonight to have Julie Foudy. She will be joined in conversation with Haley Kopemeyer, Jenny Glider, and friends. Just a few notes before we get started. Book signing will follow immediately after tonight's talk and will take place in the lobby. Um, when everybody from the stage has exited, if you'd like to line up onto the right, um, you can get in line for the signing. Also, if you've parked in our parking lot, you can get your parking validated by me or any of our event staff. Now on to tonight's guests. Julie Foudy is a two-time FIFA Women's World Cup champion and Olympic gold medalist. Woo! <laughs> Having played for the United States Women's National Soccer Team from 1987 to 2004, she was inducted into the National Soccer Hall of Fame in August 2007 and is currently an analyst reporter and the primary color commentator for women's soccer telecasts on ESPN. In 2006, she co-founded the Julie Foudy Sports Leadership Academy, an organization focused on developing leadership skills in teenage girls. Her new book, To Choose to, Choose to Matter, Being Courageously and Fabulously You, was published this past May by Disney Press. <laughs> uh, Julie is joined in conversation tonight with a number of friends, and I'm gonna let her introduce them to you now. So please welcome, <laughs> Please join me in welcoming our author tonight. Thank you. I wore my socks, especially for you guys. This is so weird, talking in a church like this. I didn't know it was going to be like a full-on church. I walked in, I was like, I might get struck by lightning, you know. This is weird. I'm going to shed layers, too. I'm, like, sweating. I'm getting naked in a church party, people! I'm going to shed layers. Oh, good Lord. Um, I was going to talk for five minutes, but instead of making you guys all stand there, I'm going to introduce my fabulous panelists, uh, my sock talkers, and then I'll talk about the book, and then we're going to talk, because I didn't just want it to be me talking. So, without further ado, first up... She is the co-owner, we should do it like PA style. She is the co-owner of the Seattle Storm with two other awesome females. Um, only, I don't know if you guys know this, it is the, there are only two all-female ownership groups in all of American major sports. One of them is right here in Seattle. And we have her tonight. Jenny Gilder, come on up. Jenny! So, I'm still talking about you. Go on up there, Jenny. So, yeah, put your socks on, Jenny. So, Jenny, Lisa, and Dawn, uh, of course, are the Seattle Storm owners. And Jenny, actually, I don't know if you guys know this about her, she rode and made four U.S. Olympic, sorry, national teams, two Olympic national two Olympic rowing national teams. One was the 1980 Olympics. Do you remember what happened with the 80 Olympics? Boycott. Uh, but then competed in the 84 Olympics in Los Angeles in the quad. Won a silver medal. Oh, yeah. Uh-huh. Jenny, we, we call that white gold because we are really still angry about it. It was against Norway, 2000. The final, we lost. Um, and she rode for four years at Yale and is part of one of the historical moments with Title IX, which we're going to talk about, which is super cool. And equally important, she's a fellow author. Yes, she is. She wrote Course Correction back in 2015, uh, and it's actually in the back. And it's a really cool memoir about her rowing and her life and growing up and going to Yale. Uh, it's called Course Correction, A Story of Loving, or sorry, of Rowing and Resilience in the Wake of Title IX. That is Jenny Gilder, ladies and gentlemen. Our next soccer, uh, sock talker played at the University of Michigan. She plays for your Seattle Reign. She got drafted by the Seattle Reign in 2013. She's one of only, Haley, am I right on this? Six originals left. 
Six originals left with Seattle, and she is rocking it this year. If you haven't seen her, she's totally rocking it. And Haley is up for a goalkeeper save of the week right now. You can vote, right? Is it still up? On Twitter, you can vote on Twitter. She's one of four. Oh, shoot. Did that happen today? Yeah, it did. Dang. Who was it? <laughs> that that listen there. Um, oh, I forgot your guys' fun fact. Jenny, do you have a fun fact? What is it? Here, yeah. And then we'll go to Haley. We don't just do bios, we do bios with fun it's kind facts. Of two parts. Is this on? Yeah. Yeah. So when we bought the team in 2008, my partner, now wife, knew I didn't know anything, so she bought me basketball for dummies. <laughs> and. When I met Brian Agler, who was our, the first coach that we hired, he worked for us for seven years. The first question he asked me was, what's a post player? I was so nervous, I couldn't answer. <laughs> Tell me you now know what a post player is. I know though. what a post player okay, is. Okay, good. That's good. <laughs> Haley, your fun fact? My fun fact. I told him if it's not fun, they're going to get gonged off the stage. No pressure, Haley. Jenny's still alive. Um, Obviously, kind of with the league being new and contracts being new and everything like that, you know, they don't, it, it's always kind of a growing process with rules and things like that. Um, and I think two years ago in my off season, I took the plunge and went skydiving. And that actually helped shape some, a little bit of rule rewriting. <laughs> so I'm proud to say that I helped spur that, spur that movement. <laughs> They rewrote your contracts? <laughs> I was told that I was never allowed to do that again. <laughs> <laughs> so the list grows. <laughs> uh, of all the things you can't do. Um, next up, I'm super excited because so much of this book talks to high school aged athletes um, and young women and high, it doesn't have to be athletes, just high school aged girls. Um, and so Khalees Barton is with us tonight. Khalees started playing soccer when she was four years old, she's from right here, she's now going to be a senior in high school, and I think she started playing at four because she had no, really no choice. Her grandfather uh, was from England, played professionally in England for like a decade and a half, Khalees, or, or longer, then moved to the, to the U.S. where he played with the Sounders, right? Her uncle also played for the Sounders. Her dad played at, this, at Seattle University, and now she's been with Crossfire Premier's under-17 ECNL club team. They just took second in the nation like three Woo! weeks ago. Yeah! And I'm sorry to say, Amy Griffin, where are you? Is Leslie with you? Is Les here too? Not yet? I'm sorry to say she's committed to Washington State University. <laughs> Amy is the coach at University of Washington. Um, Khalees, your fun fact, darling? Um, so, as you said, I've been playing with Crossfire since I was like six years old. And something funny is that I found out recently that all my, actually my best friend that's here, um, everyone was terrified of me apparently on our first tryouts when we were like U11 or U12. And I just found that out now when we're all 16 and 17 that no one wanted to be friends with me and they thought I was scary because I was taller than everyone and I wore my hair in two braids and I knew all the coaches because I like grew up in the club so I had no friends but <laughs> it's okay. <laughs> I have friends now. <laughs> you pushed through. Yeah. You got out of that comfort zone. Um, and our final sock talker is a rock star from Australia, former FIFA board member. Uh, FIFA, if you're not from the soccer world, is the governing body that oversees all of soccer. Uh, it is a largely male, a largely white organization, uh, and they don't have a lot of women. Uh, Moya Dodd was one of the fine women who sat on the board. She also sits on the board for the Australian Football uh, Federation. Played for Australia, now is a lawyer, and is starting a really cool transformational movement with women's soccer that we're going to tell you about tonight. So put your hands together for Moya Dawn! We, we allow Aussies in the church, too. What's your fun fact? Well, unlike...
unlike you, Julie, I'm quite used to being in churches. I know you have a long history of wickedness, which we don't need to go into now. But I was raised as a Seventh-day Adventist. My mum was Chinese. My dad was a fireman. And I was always used to being different. I was the half-Chinese kid uh, who lived in the fire station who had nut meat and tomato sauce sandwiches for lunch. So it's not so unfamiliar for me to be in this church. You're not going to get struck by lightning. Well, I could. I'm not such a good person. Yeah. Is that your fun fact? No, it's not fun enough. <laughs> well, how far should I go? <laughs> You're good. You're good. Moya Don, ladies and gentlemen. So the, uh, the whole history behind these sock talks in the book, so you guys know why we're up here in silly socks. You're probably like, why is she doing this? Um, so the book, of course, is titled Choose to Matter, which is very intense, and I kind of fought Disney on the title. I was like, that's kind of serious, and I'm not really serious, uh, which I know comes as a surprise. Um, but I said, it's, it's intense, and, and we're asking them to get out of their comfort zones and lead, and not just lead themselves, but go then and empower others and choose to matter and go, you know, change this world. And... I want it to be fun and lighthearted, and I didn't want to freak anyone out who picked up the cover and was like, choose to matter. I, I think the original subtitle was like, go change the world. <laughs> I was like, ah, they're not going to pick up this book. <laughs> um, so we decided, our very, we shot, we actually interviewed 10 women in the book, um, from Mia Hamm and Alex Morgan to Robin Roberts to anonymous people who aren't celebrities, who are just amazing human beings doing these really cool things. Uh, but the first interview was with Mia and Alex, and we shot them for television for ESPN. And my producer uh, said, how do you want to do these? And I said, oh my God, we are not doing like a formal sit down. As the last thing I want is like lights and a formal sit down. She goes, well, how would you normally be talking? I go, we'd have our feet up, you know, shoes off, sitting on the couch with, you know, our feet up. She goes, well, then we're going to shoot it like that. I go, yeah, we are. <laughs> So the first interview in the book, actually, the first picture you see is us in these like boring white socks because literally it was like an organic decision on the spot. And then we were like, we could call them sock talks and we could do it with everyone. And so Robin Roberts, we tell her to wear socks for her interview. We did it over at GMA where she, of course, works. And we're in the GMA studio and she rolls in with these big lion slippers. She's like, I'm going with my slippers today. Is that all right? <laughs> it's like, you're Robin Roberts. You go with whatever you want. <laughs> So it was super fun. And then we ended up um, continuing with the book promotion. It came out in May, but we've been doing this all over the place. And, it, and it's raw and it's real and it's casual. I mean, that's the whole idea with it. And instead of me just standing up here talking about leadership in the book, I thought, wouldn't it be cool to gather a bunch of cool women and we can talk um, about some of their strategies and the things they did? Because when I was growing up, uh, I came of the mindset that, you know, leadership was a person in a position of power, and it was probably a president or a politician or a CEO or what I was reading about in history books, which was, you know, a, a guy on a horse with a tall hat and a sword. And I didn't fit any of those molds, of course. So my definition was very narrow. And then I got around my teammates at Stanford, and, uh, and I have some teammates at Stanford here in the house. Yeah! <laughs> Woo! There they are! Hi, teammates! And I have some U.S. national team teammates in the house. Yeah! yeah. It's all my worlds colliding. Um, so I, I got around all these amazing women and I realized, gosh, my definition of leadership is so wrong, right? You don't have to be in a position of power to lead. You just have to understand what your style is and figure out, you know, for example, Mia Hamm, who you might have heard of. She was pretty good, I guess. <laughs> all right. We got her all those goals and things. But Mia was very private, and she was very shy, and she never wanted the spotlight. And I was fascinated by that, because I thought you had to be the verbal and the outgoing one. Um, but her leadership style was super effective, because she did it very privately. And she'd grab someone, you know, and put their arm around like an Abby Wambach, and say, hey, as they're walking off the field, this is what I'm noticing, or at halftime, or in a very quiet way. And so we had all these different styles, Joy Fawcett, who you know, didn't speak for the first 10 years she was on the national team, and literally, it still doesn't, Harv says. Uh, but literally, you know, we thought something was wrong with her, and yet when she spoke, she was always spot on, and she spoke with this incredible brevity, and when she spoke, everyone was like, shh, joy, 
is talking. <laughs> and you listen, because she, ha- she knew how to solve things all the time. So I'm watching all these different styles, and I'm thinking, gosh, my, my leadership style, my definition of leadership was so wrong. And leadership is personal, not positional. And that really was the catalyst behind the book, behind the leadership academies we started when I retired, which is what all the curriculum for the book comes from. And we've been doing leadership academies, uh, which is soccer and lacrosse and leadership in a camp form for 12 years now um, all over the country. And I always felt the real gift of sports is that you learn uh, these great lessons about life and you learn how to not just lead yourself, but work within a team and deal with setbacks and losses and all the things, the gifts that sports provide us. So uh, to be able to put it in a book form and write it and do it in a fun way, Disney, literally when I pitched the book to them, I was like, you cannot Disney-fy it. You cannot make it sparkly. Don't give me princessy things. I don't want any of that. You have to let me be me. They were like, all right, (laughs) we got it. To the point where I was like, can someone help me? They're like, you asked us to back off. so it was a super fun process, but uh, in, in hopefully the message being that uh, it's not just, as I said, to empower yourself, but ultimately to empower others, which I think is the greatest form of leadership. Enough about the book to these fine women. So my first one, oh, I'm over here. I was going to the full pew over there. <laughs> I was going to the full pew. Okay, my first question for you guys is, and I'll share my mic. Um, if you look back, right, Cleese, you don't have to look back that far, but (laughs) you look through all the different things you've done, what is the one skill set, and you can only choose one, one skill set you go, ah, that's why I was successful with what I was doing there. I think we can put our feet up on that, right? That's not sacrilegious. (laughs) Is it? (laughs) There we go. Yeah, now we're talking. (laughs) Do we have any margaritas in the back? That'd be great. Moya? I think in the environment I was, I found myself in in FIFA, the key thing for me was to figure out how all the system worked and how I was going to move within it. Uh, And I think what helped me to do that was that I didn't come from a background where, you know, I was wealthy or powerful. You know, my dad was a fireman. My mum sold Avon in her spare time. And, I, you know, I wasn't a pillar of society. I didn't belong to the pillars of society. So if I walked into a room, I had to figure out who those pillars were and how I was going to work effectively with them. They weren't going to move for me. I had to figure out how to move around them. And I think if you're a member of... Uh, uh, any kind of minority, uh, if you're a woman, you often figure out that stuff just intuitively. You don't even know that you know how to do it. But it's actually a really valuable skill, uh, especially as we move into a world where things change fast, there's a lot of disruption in pretty much every sphere of life that you can think of, technological or other. And you know that's something, being able to figure out how to work with forces that you don't control, uh, I think was uh, probably the thing that helped me the most. Great one. Um, I would say for me, it was building relationships and being able to build relationship with my peers or teammates or coaches because I learned really young that um, the relationships we make, like with your teammates and with your coaches, it's not just something that's on the field. It's like if you build those relationships outside of the field and hanging out a lot outside of playing soccer or playing any sport or school, that type of, those types of relationships really carried on onto the field. And I think that's why, at least for my team, we've been so successful and finally made it to second in the nation is because we've been so close and we were able to bond so well. And no matter how, many, how much adversity we went through or how many different changes we went through, whether it was a different coach, different team. We had a whole new team this year. Half of us were gone. We lost half of our starters last year and we were still able to bounce back because the captains and all the original people on the team knew how strong it was and how much it meant to us to build strong relationships no matter where you came from or what, like you were going to be a family no matter where you were and that's just how we've always built our team and I think I learned that really young and it's helped me not just on the field but in school and 
with everyone that I've met. That warms my heart. <laughs> oh my gosh, I love that. I always say to kids, and I say it a lot in the book, like if I look back over the years that we won Olympics and we won World Cups, right? And I could ask all of my teammates right here, you would say the one common denominator, right? Is that everyone got it. And that's the really cool thing about team chemistry that I think is lost in a lot of the noise is people think, oh, it has to come from a coach or it has to come from a captain or a set of superstars. Everyone contributes to team chemistry. The first three people we picked on a team were the 18th, 19th, and 20th player on the roster, the last three. We would go into the coach, Carla and I, the two captains, and we'd say to Tony or whoever our coach was, here's who we want for 18, 19, and 20. And they'd say, what? And we'd say, yeah. Those are our first three picks. You pick the rest. Those are the three we want. <laughs> because that mattered. That was the most important thing. Those people who got it. That's awesome. Hale? Yeah, I think um, for me, one thing that I have really kind of noticed throughout my career that is that if you kind of fight hard for others, they'll fight hard for you. Um, and you might not always be the best. You know, you might have setbacks. You might have, you know, your highs, your lows, whatever. But if you kind of help people um, and you support them and you give back to them when they need it, they're, they're going to do the same thing for you. And I think that's, in a lot of ways, it's the people and it's my teammates that have gotten me through. You know, it's, it's really easy to when you're, hot, when you're up high, um, but it's kind of those people around you that pull you up when you're a little bit lower. So I think for me, it's the work you put in, whether it's, you know, on the field, in the classroom or, or wherever it is, if people see you putting that in, um, and you do that for them, then, then they'll give it back when you need it. Mine is kind of trite. Um, but I would say persistence. Um, I started rowing when I was 17 in 1975, three years after Title IX was passed, and I was really pretty much a non-athlete. Um, I was asthmatic uh, in middle and high school, so ath sports was a little on the side for me. And I decided I wanted to make the Olympic team in my sophomore year in college. And my college coach told me I didn't have a chance because I was too small. Um, and the thing about persistence, I really believe that most people give up too soon. And it's not that I think if you keep going blindly. And sometimes I say I was just too stupid to you know, read the signs. I should have given up sooner. But it's not that you're going to get what you want necessarily if you persist, but inevitably something will happen, something unexpected, another door will open, and you will find your life unfolding in a way that trues um, to something that's really important to you. So that's mine. How, how do you get there though, Jenny? Because it, this is something that I'm fascinated by with women especially. I think we women we want to, and this was really another catalyst behind writing this book, is we want to make sure every box is checked, right? We got to be perfect, and it's what I love about women, that we're super disciplined and overprepared, and we do all the homework, but we're not going to raise our hand until we're entirely confident in so many opportunities, and by the time we've checked every box, what's happened to that opportunity? It's gone. Yeah, but I didn't do that. I mean, I really got, I really frankly got my ass kicked. I tried out for national teams starting in 1977, got cut three years in a row. I, everyone decided I wasn't prepared, but I think there are a few things. First of all, you have to want it, and you have to be clear that risk goes to the territory of living, and um, my dad was an investor, and he, you know, always invested in kind of new companies. Um, and he would always say, the only person who can afford not to take risk is the person who has nothing. So I was just trained, you kind of got to go for it. And in fact, uh, the, the other thing is, I think you have to think about what it is you love and what it is you want. And you have to be willing to put it on the line. And I think it's those little moments when you have a choice between taking another step and deciding it's not worth it. It's those micro moments when you ask, how do you do it? It's those decision points. And you have to be very aware of, OK, it's really hot out. And I said I was going to run five miles. Say so you're training for a sport. I want to cut out at three and a half. You have to be clear, what's the choice that I'm making here? And then make a choice that's consistent with what you really want. And sometimes that means, you know something? I really don't want it as much as I thought I wanted it. And that's actually a reasonable decision. It's not like going for the glory is always the right answer. But getting out of that comfort zone comes from 
wanting it. I'm, I'm willing to put myself out there because I care so deeply about this. We are always so good at looking at the risks of if we do something, but we don't think about the risk of doing, of not doing it, the hidden cost. Yeah. Have any of you guys gone through that in terms of strategies of, so Jenny's talking about, I, I wanted it so badly, I'm willing to get out of my comfort zone. What's your strategy Haley, for getting out of that comfort zone and taking a risk and raising your hand, even if all the boxes aren't checked. Yeah, I think, again, it's the, that, like, attitude of I'm going to make it work or, you know, whatever it is and, and whatever the sacrifice is to sort of get there of I'm, you know, might be, you know, living below what I think my standard is right now to try and achieve this or whatever that means, um, but that's okay and, and sort of willing to have that, I'm just going to make it work because hopefully in the long run that's going to pay off. Um, and, and I think that for me was always kind of my strategy. Is well, and you had, I, I recall, didn't you have a lot of injuries and setbacks along the way? I mean, that yeah. you had to then say, okay, I'm going to come back. Or, or 2013, you kind of got released and then you came back. I mean, talk a little bit about that to persevere through that. Yeah, I think um, in 2013, I had been drafted to the team and was on the team. Um, and then, obviously, we, the only reason I made the team was because Hope was hurt, um, and then she was healthy again, and then we only needed two keepers. Um, and so, like, Laura called me over and was like, can you meet me at Starbucks? So that's now our joke. When anything bad's going to happen, we meet at Starbucks. Um, we go to You're a like, nice... like, which one of the 5,000 yeah, in the city? Yeah, we go to a nice, like, crafty coffee shop if everything's good. So, you know, we met at a Starbucks, and she was like, you, you know, you we have to release you. And I think that that's kind of was for me, I, you know, I hadn't played, I hadn't really proved anything. Obviously no team was otherwise going to pick me up. Um, and then it was kind of that like decision moment of, okay, like I have a college degree. I have, you know, I have enough connections that I could probably get a very good paying job, but I didn't want that. So I did. I just was like, okay, I'm going to find a way to make this work. Um, and I, I set a timeline for myself. And I go, okay, I'm going to give myself seven or eight months where I'm willing to live up until the beginning of the next NWSL season. And I will do whatever it takes. I set my timeline. Um, and I did. I just, like, coached my life away. I, you know, took any job, weird thing. Someone's like, do you want to cat sit for a week? I'm like, you know it. <laughs> right? Like, I, whatever, $20 a day, I'm in. You know what I mean? Like, whatever it was, and I knew that that was my timeline where I was just going to work my ass off and, and try to find a way to get onto any team. Um, and so, yeah, and, and that for me was that sort of just, again, I set my timeline of what I was comfortable with, and then, you know, I was in my off season, and I was, like, approaching that one month within of, oh, God, I got to find a team, and, and then, like, Laura called me back and said, oh, you know, we've made some changes. We'd like to bring you back. And I was like, oh, thank God. <laughs> um, and I was thrilled. And, and I think it's also a little bit, too, it's, you know, it's humbling, but it's also not closing any doors and, you know, doing everything you do kind of with grace. And, you know, I think had I made a huge scene, I definitely wouldn't have been back um, because everybody's, you know, if you kind of have good people in your corner, they, they are, like I said, like they're going to fight for you. Um, and I'm, I'm lucky that I got that chance. Yeah. Khalees, I'm interested in sticking with this perfect theme, the added pressure of social media for, for someone your age, right? Like, we didn't, well, maybe Haley, but we, the other three up here, didn't grow up with that pressure. I always think, Mia and I always joke, like, oh, my gosh, can you imagine if, you know, all our karaoke was on Twitter? That would have been <laughs> terrible. Um, you don't know that? We, <laughs> we used to take over any restaurant. If they had a band on stage, we'd take it over. And, and Mia actually sings a very good Rocky Top Tennessee, uh, which would be her fun fact. Uh, but everything on social media that people throw out there, you want to appear perfect, right? And I'm having fun and look at me. And this is a big topic in the book of yet it's so not reality, of course. So how do you balance those worlds of 
there's so much pressure to appear perfect and you're seeing all these pictures that reinforce, oh, my friends' lives are perfect. Or, you know, we never would have known if our friends had gone to the movies without us and out, out to dinner, but now it's like, you know, you see them all at the beach together and you're like, hey, I never got that invite. <laughs> Um, it's tough. It's definitely hard. And social media has taken like a big role, obviously, in my childhood or growing up, at least being a teenager. But I mean, my mom taught me at a young age, be careful what you put on social media, especially just being an athlete or. (laughs) (laughs) And I mean, she still gets on me for that today. Just like the simplest things, oh, I saw you like that tweet, like, unlike it right now, or just, like, (laughs) the smallest things and stuff. I mean, she's definitely been a big part of that, but I would say it's just been, like, surrounding myself with the right people. All my friends know, like, yeah, don't put certain things on social media. It does portray how you look as a person, and that may not be how you actually are, but that's the first impression that you give a coach or a future teammate or anyone, a friend, and you just have to be aware of that as a young age. I think it, even when like, I committed, that was the first thing. I looked up everyone that was committed, their name, and I was like, oh shoot, like, am I gonna like her? I don't know, she looks kind of interesting. Like, that's, how, that's how you first like, think. All of my friends, we always are like, oh, should we follow her yet? Yeah, or wait till she follows me. Like, that's a big thing, like, I, that's a big controversy, and everyone's always talking about that, but I really think it's just, like sticking true to your morals, I would say, because no matter what social media is like gonna put out there, someone's always different. You never know them until you actually meet them. Like all my commits, I fell in love with them. It wouldn't have mattered if they were wacko on social media. Like their their person is gonna be how they are around you. And like, every, you just have to be yourself around everyone on social media and off, basically. You just can't be fake. <laughs> It's hard, though, because there is so much pressure, it yeah. seems like. That's, that's the thing that I always... My, my 10-year-old uh, daughter just asked if she could get on Musical.ly. Do you guys do Musical.ly? Uh, no. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Thank you. So, no, oh, McKenna's on it, and Riley's on it, and this person's on it, and it's only private, you know? And I'm like, you have to show me anything you post. <laughs> you do not post without showing your mom, right? And it stays private. The other day... She goes in the front of our house, takes a 360 of our entire house. <laughs> it's like, okay, then no, that's not going to work. <laughs> or, or I was like, stop with the tongue thing. I don't know what you're doing with the tongue, but stop it. <laughs> my mom still says that to me, too. Yeah. She doesn't like when okay, I stick good. my tongue out. Yeah, I don't like it either. Thank you. <laughs> that's what I told her. She goes, what do you mean? I go, just leave it at that. It's not a good look. Well, thanks, mom. I feel better about myself. <laughs> Um, Moya, you, with your role in FIFA, I mean, just to put this in perspective, uh, it took FIFA 109 years, I believe, is that correct? 108 to put their first woman on the board. (laughs) And this was like in 19, no, 2000. 2012 was the first first woman. You were the second? The second woman on the board. And it's, you know, Bless them, right? But it's, you know, it's a lot of old school men making decisions about soccer. And so Moya comes into this environment, which you really have to, you can't come in like a bull in a china shop because you're going to lose your seat at the table. So I'm fascinated on how you were able to navigate that, because that has to be incredibly out of your comfort zone, and effectively balance the two, because she, she passes some of the most impactful women's soccer reforms in the history of the organization in just two years you were in there. Three years. Yeah, I'm talking. Woo! I know you said you're good at navigating, but I mean, that's, that's an all world skill set right there. Well, I think you, you have to be good at observing and listening and you know, someone said to me once, you never learn anything while you're talking. Uh, and in fact, I was more or less told not to talk when I got there, you know. And, and I think they would have said the same to anyone who was new. You know, don't speak up too much. You know, you're new here. There's a kind of way things work and, and you know, you'll figure it out in, in time. Uh, of course, FIFA had a lot of adventures that I didn't expect and couldn't have anticipated. And that actually created the opportunities to make an impact. Opportunities that I never anticipated were coming. 
Uh, but, you know, when the moment comes and you think, well, I'll compare it to playing. You know, let's say you're playing a game and the other team's had a couple of people sent off and, you know, they're all a little bit flustered and you look up and you think the fullbacks are out of position, there's this big green space in front of me and the ball's just broken loose, right? So what are you going to do? You think, well, I've trained for this. This is what I came for. And you pick up the ball and you run into the space and you look for someone else who's going forward and, and you can get the ball a long way up the field. And it's just like uh, an instinct, I guess, that when an opportunity comes, you've got you've to take that opportunity. You've got to lose your fear of failure. I mean, if you're in front of a goal and the ball comes over beautifully and you think, oh, my God, what if I miss? I'm going to miss. I'm gonna, you know, you've missed already, right? But if you, if you think, well, I've done this before. I've trained a million times for this. And... I think I can do it. And you know what? And if you do miss, you know what? If you've been as good as you can be on that day, then you've done your bit. You know, you've got to lose your fear of failure. When, you, when you're playing, you're the, only per, the only person you have to impress, the only person whose standards you have to meet are your own. Uh, I mean, when I, when I played, I used to... I, I, I didn't like to think about who was watching. I didn't think, oh, my parents are here today or... You know, a scout might be here, or um, there's a there's a more than you know there's a journalist here today. There's a photographer. You know, you, you don't even want to know about that because the only person who you need to impress, that who whose standard you need to meet, is your own, and and that's how you lose your fear of failure. I think you, whatever that journey is. I mean, let's say, like, I think Olympics are kind of cruel, right? Because all these people train to win that gold medal, and guess what? <laughs> Nearly all of them don't, right? And you see these moments when people are flying, they're pole vaulting or they're doing something, and it's, they've trained for years, maybe decades for this moment, and you're going to watch failure. That's what you're going to watch. There's a final, and, you know, nine of the ten are going to fail. And that's what, that's what the Olympics is defined by. It's these moments when one person wins and everyone else doesn't. Now, why do people keep signing up to do that? <laughs> well, they do it because it's a journey. It's a journey about measuring themselves. Sure, they're measuring themselves against everyone else in the world. That's how you get gold or silver or bronze. But in the end, you're only measuring yourself against your own potential. And if you have done every single thing to be absolutely as good as you can be on the day, then you should be satisfied. If that's good enough, you leave with a big smile and you say, I was the world champion. If you fall one short, well, I think you still go home and you say, I was absolutely the best I could be, and what more could anybody ask from that? What more could I ask for myself? What more could my parents or my friends or anyone in the world ask but to be the best that I can possibly be? And if you've done everything you can to put yourself in that position to be your best on that day, then you haven't failed because you've gone on a journey that's made you the best you could possibly be. I mean, that's success, isn't it? That was beautiful. <laughs> I was like mesmerized by that. It's the accent. It is the accent. I want to talk, I want to talk like that. My husband's British and he's losing his accent. I was like, I only married you for your accent, buddy. You better, you better step it up. Um, can I give him a little bit of a historical perspective on this last board election for Asia? Okay. So. Moya, with the restructuring of FIFA, not to get too technical and into the weeds, but with the restructuring of FIFA, they did a, a very good thing. They made a, uh, a quota for women to actually serve on the board since, as we discussed, it took them so many years to actually get women in. So they were going to pick one from each confederation. Uh, Moya was applying for the, or running for the Asian women's seat uh, and sits on the Asian board. Um, but the one issue that I have with it, Moya won't say this, but I will. The one issue I have with it is the people now electing these women to sit on the board are all the member associations which are run by men, um, which in itself is not the issue. The issue is that they're more politically motivated than they are progressively motivated. So Moya loses the seat by a lot to a woman who could not name the last World Cup champion took her three tries. I mean, really, you should really just start with the United States, right? 
<laughs> she didn't. I think the U.S. was third on her list. Um, and I mean, and there were other things as well, but the great news that has come out of that, uh, the silver lining in all this is that Moya is now uh, with Mary Harvey, one of my former teammates as well, um, working from the outside and doing some phenomenal work that, can you just give them a little bit top line of what you're doing? Cause it's, it's so needed. And, and I, I say, I know like we were all so upset about the FIFA stuff because when you get a woman at the table that is really good as she was and to lose that spot and that seat at the table and get someone in there who is probably, um, and, and I don't know her, so maybe this isn't entirely fair, but maybe not as vocal and uh, transformational, then that becomes worrisome for us. But this is the silver lining. Let me put in my own words. Go. Okay, let me put in my own words. Uh, I think that what we have is a systemic issue here. Uh, I mean, I don't blame or criticize everyone for going through a process and coming out with a successful outcome that they wanted, because that's what the, the system has made that possible. And you're right, the system is one where the, the electing members were all men. Maybe women's football was not the top of their agenda when they went into that voting booth to vote. I don't know, you'd have to ask them that. But what I do know is that that women over many decades have been, you'd have to say, on the outside of soccer. It's a little different in the United States because you have had Title IX, and I remember as a player in the 80s, let's say, and 90s, um, your team just sort of, it was like, where did they all come from? And you had like a million players because you had a college system that produced all of these players. So you suddenly had women entering the system en masse, and they were good players and they were farmed off a, a large, large base of numbers. In most parts of the world, it's very different. Uh, in England, women's soccer was banned in 1921, just after the war. It was becoming hugely popular because the men's league was suspended during the war and the women kept playing and guess what? They got huge crowds. When the men came back from war, the women kept playing and guess what? They got huge crowds and then they got banned and it was banned for 50 years in England. Australia was kind of part of England in, the, for, in football terms at that time, so like we were banned as well. It was banned in Brazil, it was banned in Germany, it was banned in, in France. Um, so women were just systemically excluded from the game for decades. And it's still a game where there's a lot of barriers. It could be from Iran, when women, where women aren't allowed to go to stadiums still, uh, or it could simply be that your local club does not have a grassroots program for girls that's anywhere near as good as the one they have for boys. And that's the case in many, many countries of the world. So how do you tip that balance? Well, you got to look and you say, who in the system is going to help this change? And I think that the, the system we have, a lot has been said about sports governance. Uh, one of the things that's not ever said about sports governance is that it's really responsive to its stakeholder groups and needs. Um, said no one ever, right? Mm -hmm. And that's where I think a lot of conversations are now starting around the world across women who are involved in soccer about how we make those voices heard, how we make them carry into the room of decision makers so that we can make this game more truly open to everybody. Because let's remember, football is the most loved, the most watched, the most played game in the world, bar none, in every culture, in every continent, in every country. It's there, wherever you go, it's there. And it's hugely influential on the kind of social context and norms that we all live in. Sports like that, you take the dominant male professional sport and it's hugely culturally influential as to the way people treat each other uh, and the norms that we live under. So if we can make a difference in football, I think we can tip the balance in the world. And yeah. that's quite an ambition that's worth having. We're going to basketball after that. <laughs> um, and Jenny is already working on tipping the norm, which I love. Uh, Jenny, tell them uh, quickly about what the storm did with Planned Parenthood and what the reaction has been. Because I, I would argue the WNBA is the most socially active league out there. Yeah, One well, of the most socially active. It wasn't always active. that way though. I mean, uh, you have a lot, you look at how the leagues, you know, league is now 21 years old. You have a lot of players who were openly gay when the 
league started and the league really tried to dis dissociate itself from that part of its fan base as well as to kind of just suppress the whole idea that you could have female athletes who were also gay. It was very, very, um, it was actually, you know, kind of a disappointment. Um, I've only been involved with the league for 10 years. Uh, and obviously different franchises uh, kind of treated their athletes differently. But something has happened. I think it really started last year when athletes in general, with the whole Black Lives Matter movement, you have so many African American um, athletes, so many athletes of color, both male and female, who really were not willing to sit back and let this really important part of the national dialogue just be shoved into the background, this idea that if you're an athlete, just shut up and do your job and play your sport and you're not allowed to have an opinion. All these athletes, and I think really when you have young people, you see this, um, they've been raised in a different world. We have Brianna Stewart, Stewie, who is the number one draft pick last year, who just came onto the scene knowing that she had a platform as an athlete and she was gonna use it. So that's, um, I think that the, f the development of social media and the WNBA's leadership starting to shift together, that's a very potent combination. Because um, so, you have individual athletes now who want to do something. And then we as an ownership franchise, we've always been very committed to supporting our players. If they wanted to support Black Lives Matter, that wasn't a decision that we were making on their behalf, but what we said to them was, we got you. You know, we're gonna stand behind you, support you with the league, uh, with the league and we are, um, not gonna in any way try to silence you. So what happened, but no ownership group has ever taken a stand on any kind of political issue. Um, and certainly we by design have never done that. We, you know, every once in a while, you know, we have a mayor, mayor, mayoral race right now. We've been asked, you know, will you um, support people? And we'll support people privately, but we will not support anybody publicly. We are very, very careful. You know, there is a place for politics in sport and there's a place for not. But you know, um, in my mind, and maybe not in yours, but uh, that second Tuesday in November of last year, the world really changed for me. And uh, it was a really devastating change with a um, presidential election and a very powerless feeling. And our decision to support Planned Parenthood came out of, I think, our collective sense of, like, where can we make a difference? Um, in the national dialogue about healthcare. And you know, we happen to live in a state where our senators are Democrats. Many of our representatives in the House are Democrats. So it wasn't like we could, you know, lobby a Republican senator or a House member to do what we thought was the right thing. They were already, you know, our reps were already representing us the way we wanted to be represented. And frankly, sometimes giving money to an organization doesn't feel like enough. So being in the Planned Parenthood world, um, my mom had an illegal abortion in the early 1950s. It's always been part of my family's story um, that the right to choose your destiny um, is, a, is, a, is something that is kind of a given in my family. I was one of three girls and that my mom raised me that way. So thinking about what's happening with Planned Parenthood all across the country just made us sit back and think about how can we use our platform as owners of a franchise to raise an issue of national significance and one that totally gels with what we're about. We are about health, wellness, and girls and women pursuing their dreams. And if you don't have health and wellness and reproductive health and wellness access to that, it's gonna be hard for you to pursue your dreams. So that was really kind of how it started. And Raised almost fifty thousand dollars. Yeah. With the with the ticket proceeds going to that. Okay, my final thing. Most pressing questions. Are you ready? I didn't tell you guys about this. Haley, what is your hidden talent? Oh. I can do the Rubik's cube. What? I can solve it. Oh, you can do the Rubik's Cube? What's your time? Um, I, I think when I was like 16, that's when I learned. I could do it like, I think like in a minute and 10 seconds. It's a little bit slower now, probably. 
Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. That's very I, I, important. When you said I can do the Rubik's Cube, at first I thought that was like a dance move that I didn't know. <laughs> oh, I can't dance. That's not my, that's not my talent. No? No. Uh, really? No, it's terrible. No, no. <laughs> All right, Khalees. If you had two free hours of time, and you, you, napping cannot be your thing you do, <laughs> okay. what would you do? Oh, napping was my first one. Um, I knew it. Probably just like sit outside. I never really just sit down outside. If it's nice or like in the summer, I feel like I'm always wanting to go out and do stuff. I never really just sit down and actually relax or take it all in or... I'm always trying to go places and go somewhere. So I should probably sit down more. <laughs> love it. Slow it down a little. Yeah. I love it. I was out today. It was so pretty. I was out by the water and running, and I just, like, stopped. I'm like, I can stop. I'm not racing for anything. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> Why am I running? I'm not even going to run anymore. <laughs> and I just sat there and looked down for, like, 10 minutes. I was like, this is so great. I don't want to move. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that was after two minutes of running. <laughs> I don't think I really carried on much after that either. I was like, yeah, I'm good. Um, let's see, Moya, what do we got for you? Um, would you rather be a Supreme Court justice or sing for the Supremes? <laughs> if I, I would rather have a new talent, and that would be to sing for the Supremes. Yeah! <laughs> Unfortunately, I have no talent, although I have been a lawyer, so I feel like, you know, I can kind of tick that general box off. Singing, never. So, um, I, I'm so proud of you, because I thought for sure you were going for Supreme Court, being a lawyer, you know. Oh, that's way too much responsibility way for me. Way too boring. Uh, Jenny. Oh, <laughs> last, last most pressing que question. Where is your happy place? Lopez Island, San Juan's. She doesn't even hesitate. <laughs> Boom. It's, uh, there are very few places. Well, there are probably a lot of places that are heaven on earth. San Juan Islands, Northwest, U.S., absolutely one of them. I have never been there. Heard With dogs. Crazy. You need dogs that you can walk, preferably more than one, wandering through the woods. Really? Are you inviting me? Thank you. Absolutely. <laughs> nice of you. Yeah. No host well, we'll household. Your next week. Thanks. <laughs> Um, we, can we please give these fabulous women a round of applause? <laughs> Out of the kindness of their heart, Jenny's uh, Storm actually is playing in LA right now. Do we have an update on a score? Yeah. Uh, it's live. What is it, Lore? Uh, hold on. Hold on. Um, so, Please go and support the storm even more. Share it with your friends. Uh, what is it? 2119. Oh. 2119. Sparks, That's only by two. That's good. Okay, yeah. That's okay. Uh, Haley, when's your next home game? August 5th or 12th? Yeah, the 13th for back. And I think we got maybe some tickets in the house, did we? Did we hand them out? Rach, Rachel's got some tickets for you all. Yeah. Which game is it for? August 13th. August 13th uh, for the rain games. Um, and Khalees, best of luck to you, my dear, in this last year of playing. Oh, it's so fun. It's the best. Uh, and Moya on her next adventure on bringing the world of football together. And Thursday, yes, thank you. That's why I'm here. <laughs> I forgot that. I don't, the U.S. women play on Thursday on ESPN. Come say hello in the booth. I'll be working, but come say hi. Um, I don't even know what time the game is. I haven't sweated the details of that one yet. Seven, maybe? Yeah, seven. Seven. Um, against the Aussies, though. Mind you, the last time they met was World Cup 2015. Do you guys remember the first half of that game? Could have been, it could have been like four, four nil to the Aussies. Oh, oh, she's talking smack. I do remember the press release after that game too. 
I'm just gonna try and pull that up for the telecast. That was good viewing right there. Um, so hopefully we'll see you guys on Thursday. Uh, I'm gonna be signing in the back. I know Jenny's book is in the back as well. Um, and I just wanted to thank these women because they just said, when I said, hey, can you join me on stage? They were like, absolutely. So thank you for doing that. And thank you all for coming. And thank you to University Bookstore for hosting us in this fine temple. Will, uh, thank you, darling.